afternoon and welcome. We're back here in studio tonight and we're talking sports with Val. How you doing tonight, Val? I'm doing great, Steve. You know, the original title for this show was going to be Val, Let There Be Carnage. <laughs> but that movie just, uh, you know, Venom, Let There Be Carnage. We didn't want there to be any confusion, so just calling the show Talking Sports with Val I think makes more sense. Yeah, it kind of puts it more in the, uh, the line, but carnage is a good word for uh, this last week. I mean... There's just a lot going on. There's, uh, you know, we're already in postseason play for a couple of our sports, golf and uh, tennis now are, mm -hmm. are playing, uh, you know, regionals are done for golf, sectionals are underway for tennis. We have the soccer draw last week, so we're going to be mm -hmm. talking about that here in a few. So that's going to be starting next week. Uh, volleyball draw is coming up this weekend. Next weekend is the football draw. So, I mean, it's uh, it's getting down to it here for the fall season. We're getting uh, into the nitty gritty and going to see where uh, the regular season work that these teams have put in gets them as we get into the postseason. Steve, let's put it this way: Kendall Bradley is almost as busy as I am. Yeah, she didn't even stay for the award ceremony. She hopped right in the car, drove to Rochester, got to Blackator in time, and played the soccer half. game. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's quite the uh, accomplishment and. To be able to go from cross country and then uh, have a good half of soccer, that was pretty amazing in itself. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as we work into week seven of the football season already, that's hard to believe. Uh, Rochester Zebras are going to be back in action this week after a two-week pause. Uh, you know, it was a tough two weeks to miss, obviously. You know, the Bell game, you hate to miss that. And then on the road against Peru, so two conference games. Uh, that they missed, and they're going to be back into the fray uh, in a big way this week with homecoming. They'll be back at Blackadder, uh, taking on a, a really good Northfield team that comes in with a 4-2 and record. Yeah, Northfield started the year 0-2. They've won four in a row. They're playing their best football right now. They beat Wabash 41-13 to last week, and I was talking with Coach Ron Schaefer the other day, and he just talked about how defensively there's so much you have to prepare for when you get ready to play Northfield. I mean, they run that midline. They've always had a good fullback, and you have to respect their fullback up the middle. Then they run that inside veer and outside veer, so you've got all kinds of option plays that they can run. And on top of that, they've got a pretty good passing game. They're pretty kind of opportunistic in the passing game. And uh, they've always had a couple good wide receivers, so there is a lot you have to prepare for when you get ready to play the Norsemen. And on the Rochester side of things, you know, there's always that question, you know, are they going to be rested or are they going to be rusty? Uh, after having, you know, boy, they were really, you know, coming into their own. Mm -hmm. After losing that opener to Southwood, they had won uh, three in a row. Uh, you know, Alex Deming, I know I didn't see last week, but the week before, after missing a week of not playing, was still number two in the state in all overall yeah. yardage. Uh, I'm sure he dropped a couple more spots, but, mm -hmm. you know, he just was having a, a tremendous year. I are they going to be poised, hopefully, to continue that? And, and, and we talk so much about Northfield's offense, but their defense has been very underrated for a long time. And, you know, one thing, uh, I was talking with Coach Schaefer again, and I said, has this been, a, would you call this a normal week of preparation? And he goes, he goes, yeah, we've been practicing since Monday, basically like normal. Most of the kids have been cleared since Friday. And uh, so there's nobody uh, who's hindered or out. Everybody's cleared to play. Um, I what, one thing I asked him about was, can you run your offense the way you, you know you want to run it? Because uh, last year Rochester lost to Northfield sixty-two to nothing, and I was at that game. It was ugly, and they couldn't run anything to the perimeter because Northfield was just way faster. And he goes, you know, I mean, we have to run our plays, we have to run our offense. If they if they stop our jet sweeps and our any anything we want to run outside, then we've got to be able to counter and. It, it, and have make those adjustments to what their adjustments are. So that's going to be the key. I mean, what can Deming do against this Northfield defense that's been pretty solid during their four-game winning streak? And he was, uh, you know, as they were going into that last game that they played, they were starting to get guys back. And so they have, uh, I mm -hmm. believe, full complement in the backfield with Alex now, correct? Right. So they, they have, you know, options back there with Slosser and... Uh, Right, and and in the uh, Schlosser, I mean, you know, Faverda was really getting going after, after that Wabash game, which is the last game they played. Uh, McKee had a couple big runs in that game. I mean, they, the offense had really been 
becoming intriguing, you know, mm -hmm. to see uh, all these guys. Uh, uh, Peyton Luna had, I think, a touchdown run and an inside counter. I mean, this, this the offense was really starting to build on itself. It wasn't just the Alex Deming show against Wabash, and, other, and then they get shut down for two weeks. So it'll be interesting to see if they can pick up where they left off. Yeah. So they're going to have uh, their hands full. It is homecoming night tonight in Rochester. Also going on uh, tonight is going to be the uh, benefit uh, dinner for Coach Hughes. Mm -hmm. If you're watching this live, it's probably already started, but it'll go on until 7. Right, 4 until 7. 4 until 7. So stop by. They've got drive through You can walk up. Uh, you said uh, pulled pork sandwich, mm -hmm. chips, and a drink, all for 8 bucks. Mm hmm and, uh, you know, that's all to benefit Coach Hughes, who uh, has had some medical expenses. They're trying to help him out there. Yeah, he's done so much <laughs> over the years for the community. I mean, just uh, a tremendous, tremendous, uh, you know, person in the community. And he's just beloved in that locker room as well. Yeah. So if you uh, have some time, come out. It's going on until 7 o'clock tonight. Check that out and uh, help Coach Hughes. On the uh, uh, Tiffany Valley front, um, you know, we knew going into the game last week against Whitco, obviously Valley was going to have a, a bit of an advantage, much, much better team, but uh, they, they put up 60. I mean, basically took their foot off the gas and put it in neutral in the second half against the Whitco team. I mean, how, how dangerous is Valley as we get down to the end of the season? Boy, I mean, and again, it was just... It, there, there weren't many. I guess you score sixty points and a half. I guess it speaks for itself. There weren't many long drives. It was just quick strikes. You know, Shepard, Kirkenstein. I think those two had four touchdowns between them in the first half, and then Dalton Albert got loose. I mean, it, it, it's just uh, Jamison Virgil had a big game. I think he had two touchdown runs in that first half. So there's just so much you have to prepare for when you face Valley, and even better is that the special teams were good. Because special teams were a problem in that North Judson game. They gave up a punt return for a touchdown. They had a punt blocked. They gave up a kickoff return. I think North Judson returned around the 40-yard line. So that was not, that was a problem. Well, right away against Whitco, Braden Shepard returns a punt for a touchdown. So, yeah, the, they got some of the special teams issues figured out. And, of course, they're just, I mean, they're, they just have so many weapons, and they have a great offensive line on top of it. That was great McConaughey this week. And that will be an interesting battle because McConaughey is coming off a 72-20 to win over North Miami. They scored even more points than Valley did last week. Okay. So uh, Braxton Burner is the quarterback at McConaughey. He's only a sophomore. And do you know how many touchdown passes he threw last week? Seven. Wow. He threw seven touchdown passes in the first half. Yeah. It was 66-6 to at halftime. And now that was a North Miami team that... Uh, I think they've had some quarantine issues, and that wasn't quite the full complement of North Miami players, but still. And Burner's only a sophomore, and they're, they've got three three freshman wide receivers who are all very fast and very good, along with the Betzner kid who's a senior, and he's tough. So this is going to be interesting. I mean, this is totally different from what Valley faced against Whitco. Now they face a McConaughey team that's going to spread you out, shotgun, and they're really going to... Uh, stretch your defense out wide and long. So it'll be interesting because I think that Valley's secondary is the strength of their defense, how will they handle this McConaughey offense. Okay. Meanwhile, Valley's got to avoid turnovers on offense against the McConaughey defense. McConaughey had five interceptions against North Miami, and two of the five were pick sixes. Hmm. So seven touchdown passes and two pick sixes, you're going to win a lot of games doing that. So, uh, <laughs> so let's see if Valley can keep this McConaughey uh, team that's, I mean, again, they're very young, and they have a first-year coach. Coach Campbell com comes over from Covington to McConaughey. He, I mean, he had a high-powered passing attack at Covington, and he's basically brought the same thing at McConaughey. Let's see if the Valley defense can can stop. The, I mean, Valley's, only, Valley's not allowed a defense. Uh, Valley's not allowed the opposing offense to score a touch on their last three games. The only touchdown they've allowed was that punt return by Cheyenne Allen of North Judson. It's mm -hmm. the only touchdown they've allowed in three games. So let's see if the Valley defense can keep this going. Yeah. Valley plays the Braves, and that'll be, I mean, it's it's really been an interesting rivalry between these two teams. Uh, the home team has tended to dominate mm -hmm. uh, in this rivalry. You know, now Valley goes down to Bunker Hill. We'll see if they can, uh, you know, keep it going. I mean, Valley is ranked number eight in Class 3A. They continue to play great football. Mishawaka Miriam, you know, and Jimtown are both tied for number 15. So uh, we'll see. The, the, the computer polls have it really tight. 
mm-hmm. tighter than eight and fifteen. They they think all three of them are really right in a bunch. Draw is going to be huge on that. Who's playing who and, and where? Right. If you're Valley, you're probably going to want Mishawak Mary to draw Jim Town right off the bat. Well, that'd be, yeah, that'd be yeah. really nice for yeah. them. And then maybe be on the other side so they can meet maybe hopefully at Valley come championship game. Yeah, that would be perfect, obviously for them. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, I was right about one thing. They are going to be on turf. I guess. <laughs> yes. So I did have that right. Yeah. Which which and again Valley with their speed with Shepard and Virgil. I'm curious in Kirkenstein. It's mm-hmm. I mean. To have three fast guys like that. It'll be interesting to see if McConaughey can keep up. Yeah, that'll be very interesting. So Pioneer last week, uh, you know, obviously they had a little bit of a rough start. They had some injuries early in the season. They had a game canceled, uh, first game of the year, and ended up playing Indianapolis Asina, who's you know really having a good season. So that's you can't fault anything there. Week two, you know, very very shorthanded against Winnipeg. So zero and two to start the season. They've won four in a row. Uh, they beat a Triton team uh, last week, twenty-six to six. That's a really, really good Triton team. They've got some young players. You know, we talked about Shu and Chively the week before with uh, Culver. Mm-hmm. I mean, Shu gave Pioneer everything they wanted. I mean, he was he was beating them around pretty good, but their defense proved again that they're very solid this year. Pioneer won it with defense and special teams. I mean, because Triton plays pretty stout defense themselves, but opening kickoff, Rock Robinson, eighty-nine yards for a touchdown. Beautifully blocked. I mean, he was, was the barely, only... he was barely touched. It was just beautifully blocked. He followed mm-hmm. the wall, read it, comp- read it beautifully, and I mean, it's it's six nothing right off the bat. And, and it stayed it, that way for a long time. And it stayed that way for a long time. And then, uh, you know, the, then they get Pioneer gets a big touchdown right before the end of the half. Robinson, the only pass he completed all night, seven yards to Caden Hill for a touchdown. And they get the two point conversion to go fourteen nothing, and then the blocked field goal return in the third quarter. That was something else. I watched the video of the blocked field goal return by Eli Miller over and over again on on, on my computer. And okay, John Hi- uh, John Hines and uh, was it Adam Aaron Aaron Lowe? Yeah, yes. Who had broadcast the game? And um, John speculated that Triton uh, forgot that it was it's a live ball once a field goal is blocked. Um, I think they might be right, but I have an alternative theory. My theory is that they couldn't find the ball. Hmm. Nobody could find the ball because the ball... I mean, if you watch it again, Oscar Solano jumps through and he sticks up his hand. He, he blocks it. And even Oscar doesn't know where the ball is. Mm-hmm. And the ball kind of just dies. Like right by... But it was in back of the Triton offensive lineman's foot... And the kicker couldn't see it either. He's kind of like, where did it go? And the only guy who saw the ball was Eli Miller, and he picked it up and he ran with it. Mm-hmm. 80 yards for a touchdown. You'd almost never see... I mean, block field goal returns are even rare in the NFL, but in high school football, they almost never happen because teams don't kick field goals very often. Right. So if you don't kick a field goal very often, you're not going to have a block field goal very often, mm-hmm. much less one that's returned for a touchdown. Yeah. But it was a great play by Solano. It was a great play by Eli Miller, and you know that touchdown made it 20 to nothing, and that was... Basically, it uh, you know the the big run of the game for Pioneer was in the, you know Brock had 96 yards rushing. Bo Mersch had a big touchdown run in the fourth quarter as well. You know this team's playing pretty well. We'll see if they can keep it up against a Knox team that has you know not. It's interesting. Knox is kind of uh, in a similar boat with Pioneer, and in that they've been playing a lot of close, low-scoring games this year. Mm-hmm. I mean, Knox lost to Rochester twelve to seven. They lost to North Judson twenty one to fourteen. They lost seven to six to Laville last week. So Knox has had trouble scoring against a stingy another going up against a stingy Pioneer defense. But Pioneer's offense has struggled a bit at times to move the ball. Sure. So that yeah, that's gonna be interesting. You know, Knox comes in one and five, but uh, as you said, they've had a lot of those games that have really come down to uh, just, you know, one score type of uh, game. So uh, it's going to be homecoming night at Pioneer. So I'm sure that the uh, Panthers will be amped up. And it's obviously a conference game. So, yeah, big game. It's always always a big game when uh, the Redskins come to town. Uh, you know, the biggest school, obviously, in the conference. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, Pioneer and Knox have played some really good games over the mm-hmm. years. Uh, I think you could argue Knox is Probably, I mean, I know Pioneers only lost that one conference game ever to Winnemac, but probably historically speaking, Knox has given them the most trouble, mm-hmm, I think you could mm-hmm. say. 
Yeah, I can remember that game two years ago at Pioneer when Knox was there. Uh, I had a camera on the sideline doing some highlight stuff, and I mean that was a what I would call a slobber knocker. Mm-hmm. I mean they were you could just feel the hits, mm-hmm. and uh, you know that was uh, you know kind of the way it's gone for a long time against yeah. with Pioneer and, and Knox. Um, we should mention Derek Legrand is just playing tremendous football. Mm-hmm. I mean he was just everywhere. I mean, he is basically unblockable almost at this point. I mean, when you, when you watch Pioneer defensive film, you just watch Derek Legrand. Mm-hmm. He blew up a lot of plays in the backfield. Yeah, yes, yeah. He, yeah. He's just a one-man wrecking crew. I mm-hmm. mean, he, he's something. Yeah. And, and Oscar at that nose tackle spot, Oscar Solano has just been great. Yeah, yeah. Pioneer's defense has not been a problem this year. They've uh, they've been stout all year long. Yeah. Uh, like you said, it's just can they score? And, yeah. And they got two scores last week on special teams, so. You know, the offense still wasn't, you know, humming really good last week, but it is better, right, obviously, right, with Brock. Right, Toloza, you know, had that great game the previous the previous couple weeks. He you know, uh, he played very well against Hammond Central. He wasn't as big of a factor against Tribe. Maybe they can get, whether it's him or Bo Marsh, get one of those wing backs going, get that mm. counter play going, which is just a staple of the Pioneer offense. Yeah, if you could get Bo, I mean, that touchdown run that he had in the fourth quarter was pretty sweet. Yeah. He made some people miss and a couple cutbacks, and, yeah, you know, that was not an easy yeah. run. That was textbook blocking mm-hmm. on that play, too. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty. So if they can get him going uh, to go along with Robinson and uh, Toloza, then, you know, right. if they can get that offense going, that's... Right, and again, if you're Pioneer, maybe you look at that Knox film against Rochester and see what Deming did and see if you can maybe do the same thing because that's an, that's an example of Knox playing a wing T team. Sure, sure. Uh, Winnemac got back in action last week for their first time in two weeks. Uh, they moved to 4-0, winning 28-0 over Culver. Uh, you know you know, Winnemac obviously has high-powered offense. Culver has struggled to put points on the board. But, uh, you know, anytime you can shut out a team that's in your conference, uh, you know, middle of the pack type of a team like Culver, you got to feel pretty good about yourself, especially when you've been off for a couple weeks. Right, and I talked with Coach John Hendricks after the game and again uh, during the week, and he just talked about how how ready his team was to go, that they were there was no rust. They were just itching to play, and, you know, they go out and they score in their first two possessions and take a 14 to nothing lead, and we've talked about this before with Culver, it's just very tough for them if they fall behind early because it's just not a, an offense that's designed to, for quick strikes. They mm-hmm. they need long drives. Now again, the fumble uh, late in the first half was big by Culver because it came right after. I mean, Culver had good field position after a Winnemac fumble, and if boy, you know, I was talking with Coach Mike Zayner, and he's thinking, well, if we if we get a touchdown there, it's fourteen to seven at halftime, mm-hmm. and we get the ball to start the second half. I mean, then then we're saying, hey, we're right in the game. But then Culver fumbles the ball right back, and Winnemac runs just a beautiful uh, two-minute drill. It wasn't even a two-minute drill. It was a 52-second drill. They score a touchdown with five seconds to go in the half. Second touchdown pass of the half from Compton to Jaden Terry. And instead of 14-7, to seven, it's 21 to nothing. Mm-hmm. And, boy, you're, it's just an uphill battle, especially against that Winnemac defense. Yeah, we saw that the week before at Culver uh, versus Triton. You know, those turnovers really put them behind the eight ball. And if you're, if you're Culver in that offense, you can't. You can't get behind like yeah. that and expect to come back. Right. With Winnemac, what, what I really like about Winnemac's offense is they have multiple receiving threats. So you can't just focus, where you, hey, we're going to stop this one receiver. I mean, you got to stop Braden Heater. you got to stop Jaden Terry. you got to stop, you know, they throw this couple screen passes a game to Jaden Jones. I mean, there's a lot of different passing options in this. You know, Caleb Good is a deep threat. So you've got all these passing options. And, of course, Russell's just, he's made every throw and, done it more than once too yeah, I mean he's yeah. he basically in his fourth year as a quarterback so you know you, you run those route combinations and it's just hard to defend and then on top of that you got a really good fullback in Hayden Clark and Russell can you know bootleg and, and make plays happen him, for himself on the ground um, it's it's a hard offense to stop I mean yeah I mean I, I mean again Culver they, they try things defensively I mean you know we talked a lot about Shane Schumann as a running back on the, on the show he's all I keep forgetting he's also an all-state linebacker. And, I mean, uh, Coach Zaner kind of used him as kind of a weapon, kind of as a, like a blitzer. Kind of like, I mean, he, you know, he'd, he'd pop up on that line, and you'd, you'd at least have to respect him because he gives them kind of like a fifth lineman, and, boy, he, he can be trouble. And he, and he did make some plays defensively, but Winnemac made enough big plays offensively. Yeah. 
Well, in the, in the Winnemac offense, they're going to be going on the road this week to Western Plaskai County to take on a uh, one and five West Central team that Caston put up what fifty two on. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be <laughs> right. The, the Huber kid. Right. I, I talked with Coach John Hendricks. He called West Central's offense kind of a quarterback centric offense with the Huber at quarterback. He's he's a really nice player. He's um, you know got a good arm, but he's pretty fast and. Uh, They'll, they'll call some design runs for him, and then you also have to respect their fullback Kletz up the middle. So it's a it's a West Central team that plays pretty good. Uh, you know, it, it, it's 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 totally the the opposite from preparing for Culver. Mm -hmm. you prepare for Culver and that power team. Now you get now you're facing basically a spread option team. But again, this Winnipeg defense has been playing very very well all season. That's the fun of high school football because you can go from one extreme to the other yeah. uh, in a week with uh, you know different types of styles. We, we talked about that with Tim and Shay on the broadcast the other night about that's just the great thing about high school fo high school football. There's more than one way to do it. There's more than one way to skin a cat, and mm -hmm. uh, there's no there's no way you have to do it. I mean, there's just so much so much variety in the game. Whether you run a wing T or whether you run you know a pro style offense or a power T or a yeah. Or a spread option or RPOs. There's just so much going on in high school football today that, that you know, that there's not just one way to do it. Yeah, you know, some coaches cater the offense a little bit to the players. Sometimes you have a, a program like Pioneer that uh, you basically you run wing T from third grade on, and that's just what you do. And and so you know by the time you get into high school exactly what everybody is supposed to be doing on every play. And, uh, you know, it, it works, uh, you know, equally well uh, for, you know, different teams. Yeah, I mean, casting as the triple option, yeah. So that, that's that's the really neat thing about high school football, that there's just different ways of doing things. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you you know, if you became the coach of a college, a major college team or an NFL team and say, said, we're going to run the wing T. It might be a little different. Or run the, or run the power <laughs> T. People are going to be like, what? You might uh, you might not be in the uh, league for long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you might be uh, watching from the stands. Right, right. Sooner so, than later, yeah. But yeah, it's just uh, you know you can have different systems and then develop your identity off that. Yeah. So Culver coming off of the loss uh, against Winnemac is going to be on the road again this week, and they're going to be down at Caston, who's coming off of a win against North White. Yeah. Nice, nice win for the Comets because we talked about that game last week. Uh, you know that's a North White team that's got some some solid pieces to it. Yeah, I talked with Mike Coach Mike Zaner after the game against Winnemac, and I talked to him again earlier in the week. And again, it's just we we cannot shoot ourselves in the foot. It's just the 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 turnovers and, and a lot of the turnovers they weren't even Winnemac defense. It was just mis mishandled balls, mishandled handoffs. I mean they have I mean they've got to stop those because this whole Win Culver offense is based on time of possession and just kind of slamming the ball up in the up into the line and and wearing you out and you know i mean it they lost 28 to nothing it just didn't it didn't seem like a 28 to nothing game i mean they they got two or three first downs on just about every possession but it was just drives would stall out and it's just hard to it's just hard to maintain those sustain those possessions when you're maybe don't have a whole lot of big plays and winnemac was able to to rein in those big plays so we'll see if culver can get those big plays going again with schumann uh you know again i like blake thompson uh, Emiliano Ortiz has been dealing with a little bit of an injury. Cato was didn't have as big of a game against mm -hmm. Winnemac as he did the previous week against Triton. So you know, the, and then that you know those little pass plays to Marquez Anderson, those are basically like long handoffs. Mm -hmm. I mean, those quick little right. one, two, three throw, and, and and it's almost like a guaranteed seven or eight yards. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, I, I I don't you know, so that the that's kind of the message of the coach Zaner just. Cut down on the mistakes, and then they're going to have to again their pass defense. They give up too many big plays in the passing game, and that's going to have to they're going to have to cut down on that. But of course, when you it's different going from facing Russell Compton to facing just about anybody else. I know Schaefer's done a better job for Cast, and they got, he's gotten their pa passing game going, but it's still. And the biggest thing for Culver, they just got to hold on the ball. Right. They just cannot turn the ball over. Right. So on the other side of the things for Caston as they come into this game, yeah. how do you go up against that triple uh, look from Culver? I mean, they're just going to pound it at you. Do they have the horses that can stop that? Well, you know, I, I was, and I think they're going to have to put. You know, I, I talked with Coach Will Porter earlier in the week, and he just he was like, "Well, we can't really play our normal defense against this type," and so it's just a matter of, you know, maybe putting more men on the line. We'll see. In a lot of ways, it's the teams are kind of I don't know 
mirror images. I don't know if you'd say that, but you got Sam Smith on one side and Shane Schumann on the other, and they're both fullbacks, and they both are great defensive players, and they're both just seemingly tireless out there. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, maybe different systems, but it'll be interesting to see which one of them is it going to be like a personal duel between the two of them? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, wh whichever of those two plays better might be the indicators to which team wins. Yeah, you know, and this is this is one of those games. Last year, as Caston went up to Culver, you know, Caston was having a pretty good season, and uh, you know, Culver was able to get that win. Is this uh, is this something that you look at here as a little bit of a revenge factor for the Comets? Coming uh, yeah, in I think the... so. But Culver's had great success against Caston right. over the years, but. Yeah, I mean, Caston certainly going to be motivated. I mean, you know, they got to feel, be feeling pretty good. I mean, Sam Smith had a big game against North White, 194 yards and three touchdowns. And they're getting the passing game going, too. Josh Sullivan had a touchdown reception. You know, Josh is Damian's brother. Um, so he's factoring more into the passing game. I mean, they had about 70-some yards passing. And we talk about Landon Schaefer on offense. Boy, is he a big factor on defense, too. I think he had 10 tackles last week. I think Casson will be, you know, Casson, you know, Culver's had a lot of success in this rivalry since they joined the state, the conference, uh, since they became conference rivals in 2015. So, uh, and it's homecoming at Casson on top of all that. Yeah. So, well, both teams going in with uh, no wins in conference, so somebody's going to pick up a conference win. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it's, uh, I think time of possession is going to be big, and uh, I think I forget who was, I think it was Coach Porter who said that this game might be over by about eight forty-five or nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. I've seen the eight ball clock, too much. Clock's not going to run to or stop too much yeah. because of uh, incomplete passes. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Well, that'll be interesting. Uh, Caston hosting Culver, Culver one and three, Caston two and four. So as we look down to the uh, the conference standings again this week, Valley atop the TRC at four and zero. Oh. Rochester has not moved, obviously, at 2-1. and one. They're sitting in the middle of the pack. Northfield, who Rochester plays this week, sitting at 4-1, so mm -hmm. right behind Valley. So they've got a lot to play for. Uh, Rochester still has a lot to play for with only one conference loss there. Um, and then you've got... Um, so Valley is playing um, Maconaqua. They're sitting at two and two, so they've uh, you know they've still got a lot to play for as well. Right. The big I, I thought the big result in the TRC again last week, the one that kind of really was an eye opener. Obviously, the Valley over Whitco and North Miami over McConaughey or McConaughey over North Miami. Those weren't surprises. I thought the big one was Manchester beating Southwood right. at Southwood. Right. That was a big win for the Squires, giving Southwood their second conference loss. So yeah. Southwood's just going to have to be playing spoiler from here on. Obviously, Southwood's supposed to go to Valley on October fifteenth. Yeah. That was a that was a Manchester team that was uh, you know struggling too, and they went went in one and two in the conference and then picked up a win. That's, yeah, that's and a, a big one for them. Yeah, Braxton Ream had a huge game. I think over well over like 180 yards. I think rushing, and then you know they had Manchester had some big plays in the passing game as well. Yeah, uh, who's your North so, Conference? Yeah. Um, you still have Judson and Winnemac setting at three and zero. Uh, Pioneer is uh, holding there with one loss, three and one, as is Laville. And then we talked about uh, Culver and Caston, both O and Culver O and three, Caston O and four, and then Knox, who plays at Pioneer O and three in conference too. Right. I mean, then unfortunately, this North Judson Winnemac thing probably won't get resolved. Mm -hmm. So it's possible we'll have two teams finish with undefeated records. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to see if Pioneer can can run the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously they uh, they've already lost to Winnemac. They still have to play North Judson later on. So if you're a Winnemac fan, you might be rooting for Pioneer, right, on right. October fifteenth. Yeah, that's going to be a big one. North Judson. What does that feel like for a Winnemac fan to be rooting for Pioneer? <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to admit that. Okay. If even if they are, it's going to be <laughs> in the closet. They're not going to admit it uh -huh. out loud. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, you probably would uh, would see that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure they would love to see Pioneer pick up that win. Yeah, and that one is uh, at Pioneer, right? Or is that is that at Pioneer? Or Judson travels to Pioneer. Yeah, this, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, Judson. Uh, you know, Judson plays Laville this week. That's kind of the. That's a very interesting game in the Hoosier North. Mm -hmm. so, there are a lot of good games in the Hoosier North. In the Hoosier North this week, a lot of interesting, close matchups. Could be a lot of close games this week. Some good storylines, and yeah. yeah. Uh, top to bottom, there should be some some interesting games. All right, excuse me. Judson plays Triton. Triton this week. Yeah, Judson traveled. Yeah, 
to Triton. Yeah. Okay. And Judson coming off a loss to Culver Academy last week, so they've lost two in a row against higher class teams. So now, right, non conference games, but yeah, yeah. they've uh, yeah, you know, the Valley game obviously was one that they yeah. originally didn't have on their schedule. Yeah. And then uh, the Academy, that's a, that's a good four A team. Yeah. Yeah. And the Academy put 42 points up on that Judson defense. That was impressive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Judson at Triton, and LaVille plays a non-conference game this week against John Glenn. Yes, that's right. All right, so that'll do it for football here. We're going to take a break. We'll come back, and we'll talk some volleyball. We'll talk uh, some cross-country, some golf, some tennis, all the other stuff coming up. Here we're talking sports with Val tonight. Thanks for tuning in. In your true value has everything you need to get your next project done. Located on Main Street in Rochester, Inyard's True Value has the product to get the job done. From tools and supplies to kitchen appliances, Inyard's True Value has got you covered. Call 574-223-4920 or visit www.truevaluecompany.com. The Innocence of Youth. Is there anything any better? But soon they'll be in high school and facing all the same challenges you faced. How to make friends, how to fit in, how to be cool. We want our children to have everything they'll need to live fulfilling and productive lives. Make sure the kids in your family are among the more than 160,000 participants here in Indiana who take part in high school sports. At First Federal Savings Bank, we offer a wide selection of valuable services for our customers. We offer a variety of deposit products, such as personal and business accounts. We pride ourselves in being one of the top mortgage lenders in Indiana. At First Federal Savings Bank, we offer business loans and business checking accounts. Give us a call at any one of our branch locations and let us help you. Through LPL Financial, our financial services department is here to help you with your financial planning needs. Come see us today and see how our family can help your family. Hi, right, welcome back here. We're talking sports with Val, and uh, as we move into the second segment here, Val, let's talk some uh, volleyball. As you know, we're we're getting down towards the end of the season. The draw for volleyball is coming up uh, just uh, this Sunday. Yep. So we're gonna find out, you know, who's gonna be playing who as they move into sectional play. As we round down the regular season. Um, Still a little bit of uh, up and down for the Rochester Zebras. They had a really good stretch, uh, struggled at Warsaw, uh, came back. Um, you know, the other night they had a, a tough one. It, it always seems like that Wabash Rochester yeah. uh, matchup always goes five sets. Yep. Lost in five. Yep. Uh, you know, fifteen eleven in the fifth. I mean, two of the two of the sets went plus twenty five points. I mean, it's just a it was a, a long hard battle. Which I thought that would be a competitive match. Um, I'm actually going to look at it, I think Rochester should be looking at it on the bright side. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a Wabash team that maybe had more height, and they they were certainly, written the computer rate ratings certainly had Wabash as a heavy favorite in that match. Mm -hmm. So Rochester took them to five and lost 15-11. I, I don't think there's reason to be panicked about it. Obviously... Yeah. From Rochester's standpoint, you needed to run the table. You needed, I mean, they weren't totally out of the conference race, but you needed to run the table, and mm -hmm. you needed some miraculous things to happen. Sure. You needed to, you needed Valley to lose to or Valley to beat Southwood, and Southwood to lose to somebody. I mean, it was a, it was, it was a hail mary, and it didn't happen. So, you know, now they can focus on the rest of the season. You know, I was, you know, you were at the Wabash match. I was at the Lewis Cass match on Monday, which they won in four. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, had a little bit of a slip in concentration in set three, but really got back focused in set four. Um, I, right now, the right, the, you know, they've been very, very busy. I mean, they played, you know, Thursday at North Miami. They played four matches on Saturday in the Warsaw Tournament, then Monday at Lewis Cass and Tuesday at Wabash. That's a lot of time in a school bus. Mm -hmm. I mean, seven matches in, what is it, five days or something like that, or seven matches in six days. It was just... All I think on it was the road. On, all on the road on top of that. It's just a lot to expect. I think this team, um, again, there's there's a lot they have to play for, but now it's about waiting for that draw and getting ready to go to Bremen mm -hmm. on October 14th or October 16th if they get a bye. Um, but it's, um, you know, Emily Hughes has been dominating uh, from what I've seen. I mean, she is just pounding the ball. You know, Alexa Kuskusekis is just doing a great job at setter. They've 
They've been serving pretty well. You know, Kenzie Bradley and and uh, you know Emma Sells are doing a great job, and and of course Kylie Houston doing a great job in the back row. I, you know, she, Kylie had a, a phenomenal dig. I mean, kind of a free ball dig to keep the ball out. I mean, he, even she pumped her fist after the point was over, and the the Lewis Cass player was so surprised that they wanted to, they uh, they blew the whistle on a lift. Mm. She was like, wait, what? How's this ball coming back at me? And she she lifted it, and the, they blew the whistle. And the Rochester kids celebrated. They should have, I mean, Kylie pumped her fist. She should have. She should have been pumped. That was just an awesome play. So, I mean, this team is, um, you know, but but that was after going one and three at Warsaw, and, and there was kind of a you know they had a disappointing loss to Northfield, and I mentioned mm-hmm. that was a Northfield team they had beaten in TRC play. So, um, it just kind of the 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 meshing of. Skills is just what Coach Aaron Leap is, you know, kind of the camaraderie on court. Now that's just um, it's kind of the X factor for this team. It's but it's uh, if they can if they can get it if they get it going. I mean, they're they're just a very tough team to beat. You know, yeah. yeah. I mean, with Kennedy Leap and Lexi Thomas to complement Hughes and Kylie Coleman's been, you know, mm-hmm. providing more offense. It's, I mean, it, they're not an easy team to beat, obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know I've been impressed too with the freshmen. They've uh, you know we've we've talked about Bollinger the whole year. You know she came in early and started uh, playing quite a bit. But Dara Strasser has been playing quite a bit yeah. as of late. Lily Lett has been playing more as of late as well. So they've been really integrating some of those younger get, uh, kids in as well. Those three are pretty athletic freshmen. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know there's uh, there's a lot of good things to look at. You you said that that Wabash game. You know. There were some moments there, like, yeah, that probably should have went the other way. Uh, I thought set two, they kind of, I think it was two or three, they let it get away. They were up 24, I think 22. Set three. Set three. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they let that one get away from them. That was a, that was a tough loss mm-hmm. in that set. But they battled back. They got set four, and, you know, they were right there in set five. And then, you know, Wabash just seemed to have that ability to, to get those three or four points that they needed in a row yeah. in certain stretches. And there was a couple of the Wabash girls that were really uh, causing havoc in, with their serve. Yeah. So that's I mean, that's a good Wabash team. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They might win their sectional. Yeah. And, you know, they're young, too. Uh, yeah. You know, that Vanderveld and uh, 6'1 freshman, mm-hmm. not only power, but she seems to be very smart. I mean, she was hitting the uh, open spots with... Uh, touch plays and, and getting those kills and uh, Stumbo I thought was was playing really well yeah. for him you know as a junior I think and so that's it's going to be a tough Wabash team for some years to come in the TRC. Yeah. As for Rochester they go to I mean we're taping this on Thursday afternoon they go to Winnemac Thursday night then they get a well-deserved weekend off yeah and they are they're back at it Tuesday night at home against Valley mm-hmm. and really in a spoiler role right I mean because Valley is you know, now Valley, now again, we're taping this on Thursday afternoon. While Rochester goes to Winnemac Thursday night, Valley will host Wabash. Mm-hmm. And that will be a big showdown to see if Valley can kind of hold down and contain Vanderveld. Yeah. If they can win that, they're 7-0 and going to Rochester, and the Lady Z's might be the ones who will have to play spoiler. Yeah. I'll, we talk about Winnemac football fans maybe rooting for Pioneer. Could have Southwood volleyball fans rooting for Rochester. <laughs> That would be interesting, but yeah. it's quite possible. Yeah, if Valley can beat Wabash and if Valley can beat Rochester, they clinch it. They're they're right in position with Southwood coming to Valley next Thursday night, October seventh, and what could be a TRC championship match. Mm-hmm. Southwood still has to play uh, Manchester North Miami to get to that point. So mm-hmm. again, we're in the media; we get to look ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, Coach, it, co- players and coaches can't. You always have to take it one match at a time. We get to look ahead, and it's quite possible that that Southwood Valley match will decide the TRC. Yeah. We'll talk about it. You know, we, we keep talking about this Valley team. Um, you know, they still have some tough matches, obviously, in front of them. But to be at this point in the season, to be undefeated in the conference, I mean, you've really got to be thinking, you know, that's a, that's a great job. Uh, you know, Coach Durf, first mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a really, really good job. And everybody is good at their role, and they've you know they've had I mean they've had injury issues they've had mm-hmm. quite a few injury issues it ha- I mean it hasn't been easy and they've just plugged in new players and it's been kind of next girl up mm-hmm. and they've just continued to play great volleyball I mean Mallory Durkis has been great all year 
Uh, you know, they get a lot of offense from Bree Sheets, but Bree's been hurt at times. Ava Smith's been hurt at times, and they bring in different players, and, you know, they've helped out. We've talked about Rochester's really athletic freshman. Well, we need to talk about Valley's really athletic mm -hmm. freshman. When you talk about Avery Wagner and Michaela Castello, I mean, they, they, they fit right in with this team. Mm -hmm. And then Braden Bainey, just the best libero. I mean, she either she or Kylie House is probably the best libero in the conference. I mean, they are both great. And, uh, you know, Macy Kirkenstein has just fit right in at, at that center spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing how well they've done putting those pieces together. And you got to yeah. give Coach Durf a lot of credit. And Valley's got a lot of serving variety coming at you, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, serving, I think, is kind of the underrated part of their game. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a very good serving team. And, yeah, so it's, it's, just a, it's just a very, very solid volleyball team that doesn't beat itself. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they had kind of a rough, now they had kind of a very tough trip to Oak Hill the other night. I mean, I saw Oak Hill play earlier this year. Oak Hill's tough. Oak Hill beat him Valley 16-14 in the fifth. I mean, that's a, a long drive back from yeah. Converse to Akron. Yeah. But, then right, you know, Valley bounces right back on Tuesday night, and they beat Marion in three. So, mm -hmm. you know, but now, so we'll see kind of where they are. You know, as we head toward the real nitty gritty part of their schedule, mm -hmm. Wabash, Rochester, Southwood. Yeah, those three TRC matches left. It's still very tough uh, matches in front of them, but mm -hmm. they have uh, basically they're in the driver's seat. Yeah, they I mean, control their destiny. If they can win out, yeah, they got it. Yeah, which would mean I mean that would be just a huge deal at Valley. I mean mm -hmm. they, they have, the, I mean they've never really factored in a TRC championship mm -hmm. for volleyball. It's been, it's been a Southwood and Rochester conference over the years with. You know, and obviously since McConaughey has been in the conference, they've kind of peeked their head into the things, and they said, "Hey, we're we're here, and we're ready to go. We're ready yeah. to compete for championships." And you know, they've been up there as well. But it's been, you know, that Valley's been kind of an afterthought. Mm -hmm. So it's let's see if Valley can can make that next step as a program. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. They've uh, they've got control of the wheel. And mm -hmm. speaking of control of the wheel, uh, another team that you. Uh, I think you just missed the game the other night. You were trying to do the double again, but uh, Pioneer goes uh, seven and zero in the Hoosier North Conference, wins it. I think uh, what did I see? They've only won or only lost one conference match in Hoosier North play, yeah, and something like three altogether in uh, go back to the Midwest yeah. Conference in the last twelve years or something. Crazy I mean, like just that. just down, I mean that's, that was a really good Triton team, and Pioneer just dismantled them twenty five eleven, twenty five thirteen, twenty five twelve. Rod Nyes is not easy to please, mm -hmm. but even he was pleased after the way they played the other night. I talked with him a lot. This team's playing good volleyball. And, and not only that, but Brooklyn Borges and Bell Blickenstaff are both injured. Mm -hmm. It just goes to show you the depth of this team. Right. I mean, they have just so many options. Haley Kripe was in top form the other night. And, uh, you know, and again, I mean, they had to play a conference match at LaVille on Monday night. Mm -hmm. On the road. On the road, mm -hmm. so... Uh, and then come back at home and play Triton on Tuesday with no practice, and that but that's tough because that's a tough Triton team with a lot of height. But I mean, they just I mean they just dominated that match, and I I hate the way the schedule has played out. Pioneers in the barn at seven and zero. Caston's four and one. They still have to play Knox and Triton. Mm -hmm. What's Caston's motivation now? Right. Sectional. Yeah, I mean I mean that's that's tough if if we can somehow coordinate the schedules to. Where it all comes down to maybe one night. I mean, because you don't want teams having different motivations. Right. Um, so I guess that's my editorial comment. But staying on Pioneer, I mean, they're playing great volleyball right now. Haley Kripe will, again, we're taping this Thursday afternoon. Haley Kripe will not play against Frontier on Thursday night. She's on an official visit to Kansas. She's already verbally committed there for softball, but she gets an official visit. She's taking her official visit, so we'll see how Pioneer can function without Haley. Yeah. But, again, the conference portion of the season is over yeah um pioneer does have a big uh one well, big from the standpoint of a very good test against a very good benton central team coming up on tuesday night mm -hmm. saw them a few times over the summer i mean they're they're solid yeah <laughs> yeah and, and it seems like benton central always has girls you know six foot six foot two yeah they seem to find them you know coming out of the weeds out there but uh, you know, I was very impressed on Monday at LaVille. I didn't get to go to Triton on Tuesday because I was at Wabash. But I was impressed with the, uh, uh, you know, Kylie Adinger came in in uh, place of uh, Brooklyn Borges, mm -hmm. you know, who was hurt. And, you know, she's she's 5'10", 5'11", you know, mm -hmm. solid uh, height, you know, for a sophomore coming in. And, and she played, you know, good in the middle. I thought she, uh, you know, like you said, next man up, next girl up. Yeah. So... 
And Coach Nines really praised Mackenzie Robinson. She's mm-hmm. really stepped up her game as well on that libero spot. Yeah, you talk about the libero uh, situation in the TRC. I mean, she's got to be right up there in the conversation with the uh, Hoosier North. Yeah. she's uh, She's been really solid this year. Yeah, so even though the conference portion of the season is over, there's a lot of good matches that will help them get ready for that sectional. 15 sectionals in a row. But in the ratings this week, Southwood is ranked number 8, and Pioneers ranked number 12. Yeah, yeah. So it's all designed to be ready to face the Lady Knights on their floor at the sectional. Yeah, at some, Southwood. Yeah. Right. So then uh, you talk, you you mentioned Caston 4-1 and one in the conference. They still have some stuff coming well, up. Oh, boy, this team has been playing big-time volleyball. I mean, they, we need to re- we need to give them <coughs> some props. I mean, they beat North Judson at North Judson. Didn't just, they swept them mm-hmm. at Judson. Yeah. I mean, I don't think Caston had ever beaten North Judson before, much less swept them. Mm-hmm. And they're four and one. Their only loss in the conference was to Pioneer. I'm really curious to see now. now okay, now again, we're taping this Thursday afternoon. They go to Knox Thursday night. Let's mm-hmm. see if they can. I don't think they've ever beaten Knox either. Can they win those two trips to Stark County in a week? Can they pull them both off? Mm-hmm. And then Tuesday night at home when Triton comes to town mm-hmm. to face a team with a little more height and maybe some athleticism that can maybe match up with girls like. You know Williamson and Scales and mm-hmm. Maddie Smith. So those are, those gonna be some good matches. Yeah, two uh, two tough teams yet to go for uh, for Caston, but you know that's that's another thing. You know, as a proving ground, is they're getting ready for sectional. Uh, right. And you talk about what's their motivation. You know, they're still looking at that uh, that in prize that sectional. Right, and that came after Caston. And again, again, you don't like. If you're going to play back-to-back nights, you want the conference match to be on the first night. Well, Caston played a non-conference match at North Miami on Monday and swept them. Mm-hmm. And then came and then another get on the bus again and then went at North Judson on Tuesday night. This team's just playing really well. And, I mean, they're, they, you know, they think they can win the sectional. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't tell them that they can't. I mean, they're, you know, we're talking about Pioneer and Southwood. Mm-hmm. Don't tell Caston that they can't win. Yeah, yeah. That's gonna be uh, that's gonna be an interesting one down right. there at Southwood. Remember, Caston got a win over Northfield this year as well. Mm-hmm. So they beat Northfield and North Miami, who are two sectional opponents. We would imagine they're better than Lakeland Christian. Mm-hmm. If they're running that very good tournament, six team tournament at Caston on Saturday. Caston, uh, OD, West Central Valley, Laville, and North White are the six teams. Okay. Valley is going to Caston on Valley's Saturday. Valley's going to be there. So as we well. talk about we t- yeah, we talk about Valley with the three conference matches. Valley also got that tournament at Caston on Saturday. Okay. So uh, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot of uh, a lot of good volleyball to be played. You know, you talk about Saturday, then in Sunday we're gonna look and, and see where uh, who these girls who these teams are gonna be playing when mm-hmm. we get into the sectional play. Yeah. So uh, very interesting. Um, Culver, um, a salute to Coach Andrea Barrett and the Lady Cavs. They beat Laville at Laville yes. on Wednesday night, their first conference win in three years. In three years, September twenty sixth, twenty eighteen. So almost. Three years and three days. Has it been that long? It's been over three years. They went 0-7 two years ago. They went 0-7 last year. They were 0-6 last night in their final conference match of the year. They went at 16-14 in the fifth. Yeah. Kudos to Coach Coach A and her team. They, again, a sign that they're really moving forward. And that was their third match in three nights, by the way. They played Community Baptist at home on Monday, won that one, lost at Elkhart Christian on Tuesday, mm-hmm. then had to get back on the bus and go to Lavelle on Wednesday and pulled it out. Yeah. Beat a 2 A team on the road. And that's a, you know, like I said, I was up there Monday. That's a good LaVille team. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's nothing to, you know, look down on as a win. I mean, that's a really good win for them on the road. Yeah. So, you know, they're going to be um, Triton, right? They'll be at Triton for their sectional. Right. With, uh, with Argus. Mm-hmm. So you know that's not going to be an easy road. But for the computer, the computer rank, you know, the computer ratings say that Triton's the heavy favorite, but that they basically have Culver as the second favorite if a team is likely to. The team can somehow upset Triton. Culver's the team, but we'll mm-hmm. see. Still young. Still very young. Yeah. 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 Very young. So um, we talk about Cast and we talk about Culver. Talk about Pioneer. Uh, Winnemac, um You know, obviously they've just they've just not had enough time together. Right. I, it, right. Again, they're playing Rochester uh, tonight, Thursday night. Right. So. We'll see. I mean, they've finally gotten some good practice times, mm-hmm. and hopefully with a full complement of players. So that's going to be the key to see. Alyssa Villanueva had been out with quarantining. I, I Hopefully she'll be back for the Rochester match. And uh, I was there for the Pioneer match. I was 
a little surprised at their height. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're pretty big. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the, you know, the biggest thing obviously is just they have had so many girls out in different times. I know, you know, when we were at Harrison for that JV invite, uh, mm -hmm. Shay was saying they've only played two JV matches all year because mm -hmm. a lot of the JV girls were playing varsity because a lot of the varsity girls were out. And it's just, uh, you know, it's probably too late in the season now, but, you know, there, there's some pieces there for uh, Coach Kasten to, to work with. Yeah, I mean, obviously the conference is over with now, so it's kind of getting focused for the draw and the sectional, which should be wide open. I mean, North Judson won it last year, but they are not nearly the team that they were last year. They just right. graduated so many kids. They still have the two uh, Martin girls, mm -hmm. but it's not quite the North Judson team they had last year. Uh I think it's wide open. I mean, Rensselaer's look pretty good. Boone Grove has struggled. Hebron struggled. It's going to be a team who gets hot that particular week. And yeah. right now, it's from Coach Kasten's standpoint, it's getting your team to peak at that date. Right. Why not? Yeah. Why not Winnemac? Right. So. Right. I mean, Rensselaer. You know, Rensselaer beat Winnemac earlier this year, but they're they're a team that doesn't have a, a lot of historical success in volleyball. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I really don't know who's going to win that. Yeah. I mean, Winnemac and Judson are probably are the two historically best programs in that sectional, but who knows? Yeah. I think if you throw, uh, you know, Winnemac and Judson together, you know, in a match, that that's a 50-50 match. Mm -hmm. It really is. So, you know, maybe they can catch fire at the right time. Right. And get right and get both Villanueva and Mackenzie Hines going mm -hmm. hitting-wise. Right. Because you know you're going to have good sets coming from Kaya Campbell. Mm-hmm. All right. Anything else, soccer or uh, volleyball wise, before we move into yeah, soccer? Yeah, I, I just think the, yeah, it covers it. The volleyball draw is seven p.m. on uh, Sunday night, and I'm I'm very, I'm very curious. There just seem to be there. There are more competitive teams. It's not so much that the the top teams are good. It's that the bottom teams keep rising up and can be pesky. Mm -hmm. Rochester will be uh, going to Bremen. Uh, Valley is at. Is that at Lakeland or Wawasee? I believe it's what you cut. I think it's Lakeland. Lakeland, yeah. So Valley will be in the 3A. Rochester, obviously, the Winnemac, we said, will be at uh, Boone Grove, right? Right. Rochester goes to Bremen. Winnemac goes to Boone Grove. Cast and the Pioneer go to Southwood. And then Culver, Culver goes to Triton. Yeah, Culver and Rogers go to Triton, so... All right, well, we'll wrap up that part. We'll talk some soccer here. Uh, the draw came uh, last Sunday, so we know where everybody's going. As you look at the uh, the meat grinder, we'll call it, the Fort Wayne Canterbury Boys 2A sectional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, think back last spring when we were talking about that uh, softball draw in the sectional at North Miami and the sectional at Winnemac. I kind of look at this one the same way. Yeah. Whoever makes it through that thing is probably going to be your north, if not your state champion. Right. I mean, we have a possibility of Argus playing Fort Wayne Canterbury in the sectional semifinals <laughs> on Wednesday night. Those teams were the runner-up in 1A last year and the runner-up in 2A, mm -hmm. playing in a sectional semifinal game. Canterbury's had a little bit better season this year, though. Yeah. They're, 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 they're ranked number one, and yeah. they have been dynamite all year. Uh, and on top of that, they're at home, and on top of that, they get the bye in a mm -hmm. seven-team sectional. So I guess the Cavaliers are the favorites going in, but it won't be easy because you've got number four, Fort Wayne Concordia, number 11, Culver Academy in the sectional, and number four, Fort Wayne Concordia, is who Rochester happened to draw. Right. So uh, Rochester played Fort Wayne Concordia two years ago in the sectional at Culver Academy. I was at that game. Concordia won it, I think, 5 nothing. Uh, I thought Rochester played actually pretty well to lose only five to nothing. I mean that was a that's a talented team. Coach Mackey has been there a long time. I believe that's his son who scored twenty one goals this year for Fort Wayne Concordia. But how does Concordia? How do the Cadets win games? They do it with defense. Fifteen games, they're ten two and three. How many goals have they allowed in fifteen game? Fifteen games, ten all season. Yeah, less than a goal a game. Yeah, playing again in Fort Wayne, playing in that Summit Conference. Not a bad average. Not bad. I yeah. mean that's. You're shutting down some pretty potent teams. So, you know, I think for Rochester, you know, I talked with Coach Elmer Roque. He, he really compared, uh, he, he's, he's already looked at a lot of films since of Concordia since the draw came out. They're, he's talked a lot about, he said they look a lot like Bremen. And Rochester was coming off a 7 nothing loss to Bremen on Saturday. And he goes, he 
Coach Rogue said, we lost 7 to nothing. Frankly, I thought that was the best game we had played all season. Hmm. We played really well. That's a, just a great Bremen team that's ranked in the top 20 in Class 2A. So he thinks that from if they can... If, that they if they just fix those little mistakes they made against Bremen and get maybe an early goal against Concordia, who knows? So we'll see how they do. This is a Concordia team that's obvious, but as I mentioned, they played great defense. So, you know, we'll see. But that, if you pull off an upset in soccer sexuals, that's kind of usually how it happens. You score first and then play great defense from there. Right, right. We'll see how it happens. We'll Strange, it happen. Stranger things have happened, yeah. that's for sure. And you brought up Argus and, and CMA as we're taping this on Thursday. Uh, they're going to be playing Thursday night for the, I think, 102nd time. Yeah. The first two teams in the state of Indiana to have soccer. The first year, I think it was, uh, they played three times and they were 1-1-1. One, one, and one. Yeah. And uh, that know, was... 1964. 50, 57 years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, 60... I can't do the math in my head that quick, but yeah, 64, 65, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. So uh, their rivalry renewed for the 102nd time. Yeah, Argus coming off a 1-1 tie with Andrean on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. That was after a 6 nothing win over Oregon Davis on last Thursday. So it's a team that uh, maybe doesn't quite quite have the same firepower that they had, but my goodness, I mean, that those teams were just, the 2019 and 2020 teams were just so explosive. Mm-hmm. But you still got, you know, I mean, Teddy Redinger and Michael Richard and and... Uh, you know, Vladimir Bernard. So you've got you got some offensive weapons. It's kind of uh, can they get them all going in the same day? Because um, obviously after they play Culver Academy on Thursday night, then you travel to Bethany Christian on Saturday, and those two games always get them prepared for sectionals. But then after the the Saturday game at Bethany Christian, then you basically don't have any practice time, and you have to play Valley at Fort Wayne Canterbury Monday night on their first sectional game. Mm-hmm. Now Valley did beat Argus five to one the other night, but that was an Argus JV team. Argus right. is. Argus usually doesn't send their varsity for that game. And make this is really the, even though they, a team from Valley has played a team from Argus before. This is really the first time the Argus varsity has ever played the Valley varsity. Right. So they, uh, we'll see how they do against uh, Valley, who's, you know, kind of you know a fundamentally uh, solid team, but has maybe struggled to stop teams a little bit at times. Right. So, right. but again, whoever wins that Argus Valley game will play Fort Wayne Canterbury in the semifinals. Yeah, congratulations! You won a sectional game. Yeah, here's your opponent, number one in two A. Yeah, <laughs> at home. At home. Yeah. So after you drove, you know, an hour and a half to get here yeah. for the second time. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's you know we we knew that was going to be tough, and, and like I said, I, I think whoever wins that thing is is poised to be your north uh, right. north champion, if not the state champion. Right. For Valley, the key kid has been John Ruiz. He's played great all year. He's just a He's just so he's multi talented. I mean, he can mm. score goals, but he can set up his teammates as well. He's such a good player. And then you've got Caleb Petgin, who provides some speed. Uh, but in a lot of ways, I think it's going to be in that back row. Can you keep? Can you? Can you? Can you handle? Can you handle things defensively and maintain at least some possession where you can get? Where you can maybe give yourselves a chance to get a goal or two on the board? Because when Argus, I mean, when Argus is playing well, they just dominate possession. Yeah. Uh, so then, in the other sectional in our area down at Caston, yeah, we should mention Rochester, Rochester Fort Wayne Concordia is the on the other half of the bracket, mm-hmm. and the winner of the Rochester Fort Wayne Concordia game will play the winner of the Manchester Culver Academy game. Right. You know, Manchester has been right in the TRC mix. Culver Academy ranked number eleven in the state. Yeah. So. Yeah, Rochester's uh, Rochester might have to play Fort Wayne Concordia, Culver Academy, and Fort Wayne Canterbury. Yeah. To win the sectional. Yeah. yeah that's... Or Argus. Yeah. yeah. They would uh, they would definitely uh, earn it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the the other uh, sectional we're going to talk about for the boys side of things would be down at Caston. Right, the Class One A sectional down at Caston. Class One A Caston, Culver, and uh, Winnemac and North Miami. I, I didn't I don't remember who who drew who on that one. Winnemac drew North Miami. Culver drew Caston. Oh, I had that uh, right. Yeah, I, I wasn't even trying to do that. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, uh, the Winnemac North Miami game will start at six p.m. on Wednesday, and that'll be followed right by the Culver Caston game around eight p.m. And then the winners of those two games come back uh, on Saturday night uh, for the sectional final. And uh, you know, Winnemac has a win over North Miami, beat them three to nothing earlier this season. Caston beat Culver two to nothing. You know, it's a Caston team. You know. Uh, you know, Winnemac has been playing great soccer. I mean, this is uh, one of the best years they've had. They've got, you know, Thomas Fearens and 
I think they should have more depth against the North Miami team that struggled to score goals this year. Meanwhile, Caston, I think they probably have a little more depth against the Culver team that's really playing with only about 13 kids, right. uh, if that. So, uh, again, Jonathan Pacheco had a great game the other night. He had a hat trick. They beat LaVille 5-3 to at LaVille. Again, we're taping this on Thursday. Caston is playing at Winnemac on Thursday night. It's for the Hoosier North title. Both teams are 2-0. and mm -hmm. It's only a four-team conference, so you only play three conference matches. Both teams are 2-0, and so this will decide it. But it's also maybe a sectional final preview. Right. Because you'd have to think both of those teams will be favored yeah. from our standpoint. Right. And it could be a couple of uh, opportunities, whoever wins both of those games. I mean, there's there's a lot on the line. Yeah. So, uh, Cade Zider had a goal the other night. So, Cass and, you know, that was a nice win at, to beat Laville at Laville. Good, mm -hmm. good win for them. Mm -hmm. uh, on the girls' side of things, uh, you got to look at that, uh, you know, first game. Rochester and Ar or, uh, Rochester and Culver. Right, the class uh, one a sectional at Argus. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, it's nice too. It's at Argus this year. Mm -hmm. uh, a rematch of a game that was played at Blackadder earlier this year that Culver won uh, three to two. Yep. So uh, you know, if you're Coach Rensberger uh, coming into uh, to this game, what do you do different? What do you do the same? Of uh, finish. Yes. Finished because that was Coach Rensberger really said that that was problem. We just played. We we need to we need to find ways to put the ball in the back of the net because pose possession was really not. That, that, first of all, that Culver Rochester game back earlier in the year at Blackator that was probably the best soccer game period I think I've seen this year mm -hmm. from an intensity standpoint and up and down action. I thought that was a heck of a game. Mm. Um, I think I don't think she was upset with. The level of possession, it was just finishing, finding mm -hmm. ways to finish and put the ball in the back of the net. And that was the issue against uh, Culver in that game. Uh, so it's, you know, and I think they've kind of figured that out. Rochester comes in on a six game winning streak. They beat uh, Northwestern the other night, five to two. That that was a really good, pretty good Northwestern team, and they beat them. Uh, you know, that was coming off, you know, they just rolled through TRC, play went 5-0 and and outscored their opposition 31-2, to beat North Miami, I think it was 6 to nothing the other day. Mm -hmm. And that was after, what, 7-1 to over Wabash. I mean, they, and even beat, you know, a Manchester team 2 to nothing that had given them all kinds of problems over the years. Manchester basically been the best girls soccer team historically in the conference, but Rochester just dominated things this year. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the goal scoring has been spread out. I mean, Amy Williams can score. Macy Nelson can score. Emma Houdeshell set the school record for goals in a season. You know, even Callie Watson's been, chip, Callie Watson's been chipping in with some goals. Um, Kendall Bradley's been chipping in with some goals. I mean, we think of Ken, Kendall as maybe more of kind of a rover, kind of a midfielder. But even she's kind of somebody that teams have to account for, so... And uh, defensively, they've been playing pretty strong. And, yeah. you know, George, yeah. uh, their Kaylee keeper. Woods, yep. Yeah, I mean, she's had a really good year. I, I I, thought that Culver game, I mean, she was very impressive because there was a couple opportunities that Culver had. Yeah. Uh, you know, they had a couple PKs that mm -hmm. she was able to stop. I don't remember if she stopped two or one, but... One, yeah. yeah. And Sophie Heath of Culver, she stopped two PKs yes. in that game, and I think we might have the two best goalkeepers in our area. I mean, Lizzie Edmonds, I'm sure, would probably like to have her saying that. But yeah. yeah, I mean, Sophie Heath was tremendous in that game, and with Culver, I mean, they you know they they won nine. They're twelve and three in the year. They won nine of their last ten, mm -hmm. and their only loss in that out of those ten was two to one to Lavelle, and Lavelle scored the game winning goal with like less than two minutes to go in the game. Yeah, just a heartbreaker to lose that one. But boy, they've been playing great soccer. Kaylee Hamilton. Uh, Cassidy Banks and Giselle Villegas all have between 17 and 21 goals. Yeah. So you can't focus on any one. Right. And uh, I think they're averaging something like five goals a game as a team. I mean, they, they have been hard to stop. Giselle Villegas scored the game-winning goal in that Rochester game, 3-2 to two earlier in the year. But, again, you can't stop. It's not just one girl. I mean, A.J. Neese has just done a great job in turning around that program, and this team thinks they can win. And they've got some good young players and some good veteran players, and they've got two great leaders in Villegas and Kaylee Hamilton. So the winner of that Rochester Culver game would get the winner of game two, which would feature uh, the Argus Dragons and right. Bremen. From what we hear, they, they might be flipping around those two games. The Argus Bremen game might go first, and the Culver Rochester game might go second that night. Okay. Um, we're looking to confirm that, and we'll have that we'll have that on either Twitter or on my blog or both uh, mm. within the next couple of days, just mm. to figure out what's going on there. But um, yeah, Argus and Bremen. I was I was at the Argus Bremen regular season game. I'm Saturday night, Argus won three to one. Then the next day, they drew each other. 
Um, Bremen actually tied that game 1-1 with about 20 minutes to go, and 39 seconds later, uh, Lauren McLaughlin scored, and Argus took the lead again. Mm -hmm. And then Ariana Allen scored again. Argus dominated possession. I mean, Bremen had two shots on goal the whole game. Uh, Argus dominated possession. It didn't seem like a 3-1 game. Uh, Argus's touches were a little off. Lily Hines and Emma Dunlap struggled a little bit. Uh, just not quite in sync. Um, but, again, they're terrific players, and you'd have to think they'll be ready to go by sectional time. Bigger picture in that sectional, you know, obviously Argus has dominated the last few years. Anybody right, they, that they can, won the sectional three years in a row. Yeah, anybody that can give them a, a realistic shot. Well, the pollsters certainly don't think so. Argus is ranked number five, and nobody else is ranked. I, I'm, I mean, again, Rochester played with Argus for a half, really for 60 minutes they played with them. Uh, and a, Argus doesn't play Culver during the regular season, so it's hard to say. Mm. But again, this is an Argus team that, I mean, they, they just dominate possession. They're, the the Argus defense, the structure of the defense just works It works well. I mean, mm. it's, I mean, you, uh, when you talk about Samantha Redinger, I mean, she is great. Allison Zahm is playing great. Carly Miller is playing great. Mm. I mean, they, they don't make mistakes defensively. Yeah, Kaylee Markley back there. Kaylee Markley back there as well. Mm. And then Lizzie in goal, I mean, the, the one shot that Bremen scored on, that was just a perfect shot in the back right corner of the net. There was nothing Lizzie could do, but, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, she covers Yeah, <laughs> she covers so much space. She's 6'1". I mean, right. I mean, this was a shot that was in the upper right corner of the yeah. goal. It was just, yeah. yeah. It was, you you got to hit right, certain yeah. spots to, to be able to get it through. Right, by the Noonan, the, by the Noonan maker girl of Bremen. She's going to have to... You could tell watching Bremen that Noonan Maker is their key player. She's gonna have, if Bremen's going to win that game, she's going to have to do something big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Argus, you know, they're coming off of a, a great run last year. Obviously got to be in the semi-state to the uh, eventual state champion, right? They right. won that, yeah, the LCC. Yep, so Central Catholic, yeah. You know, LCC is up in 2A this year, so, you know. I think it's going to be wide open. I mean, you've got, you know, some... Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be wide open, especially in the north. I think right. that there might be a little more firepower in the south. Uh, but, you know, will we have, say, an argus Andrean rematch in the regional? Well, that's possible. Andrean's been ranked around number 10, number 12, somewhere in there yeah. all year. So that's possible possibility. Yeah. They have the regional as well? No, it's split. So they would have the first round, if I read that right. So they would have... Right, if Argus wins their sectional, they would host the regional semifinal game on Wednesday, October 13th. Right. And if they the, win that game, then the regional final will be Saturday, October sixteenth at Westview. Yes. So they've yeah they've they've really changed that whole. Is the are the boys that way too? Right. The boys regional semifinal games will be played uh, Thursday, October fourteenth, all throughout the state. If Argus wins their sectional boys, uh, they would play the uh, regional semifinal game on the road. Okay. If they win that game, the regional final would be at Norwell on Saturday, October 16th. Wow. So they would be... Uh... Right. This was designed for schools. And if you have a girls team and a boys team still in it, and if you saw what uh, Sandra Walter said during the draw telecast, it was if you have a girls and boys team, maybe you can root both on at the same venue. Well, that doesn't figure in for the Argus because they've got their girls team is 1A and their boys team is 2A, so that's not possible. Yeah. So you could have... Well, and that's yeah. that's been the case for Argus over the last couple of years. You right. know, that Saturday of regional Saturday, you know, they were at Argus with right. the boys and the girls were and, at And they finally altered the schedule so one game is played in the <laughs> afternoon and one game is played at and night. And now they're in different divisions. And now they're in different classes, so that that does screw things up. Yeah, so, but, yeah, if you're a, an Argus or a Rochester or a Culver girl soccer fan, know that if you win your sectional, you will host the regional. Mm -hmm. So that would be pretty cool if we had a regional semifinal game at Blackdoor or even at Culver. That would be pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, would they bring in some bleachers or something in there at Blackdoor? I mean, there's there's no seating. I mean, that's... And when would, when would they start the game? Because the field has no lights. Right. So would a team have to make a long trip to... An early yeah. early game? Because this time of year, you know, it's getting dark a lot earlier than yeah. it was. Yeah. I know that. I, ugh, I don't like that. Yeah. But, so... Yeah, it's going to be interesting. So, anything else uh, soccer-wise? Tippecanoe Valley girls drew Fort Wayne Concordia in their Class 2A sectional. They're going to have to play Concordia on Concordia's home field. Okay. Uh, first ever sectional game for Coach Gordon's team. So, they are playing because we, 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 we were uncertain about that, but they are in the state tournament. So, okay. 
first but year first year program. Yeah. They lost to Maconaqua nine to nothing the other night. They'll play a Concordia team that has a winning record. Uh, the, it's a five team sectional. Uh, the winner of the uh, Leo Garrett game will play Columbia City in one half of the bracket, and then Valley will play Fort Wayne Concordia in the other half of the bracket. So Valley only would have to win two games to win their sectional. Okay. Having said that, Leo, they are ranked number 10 in the state. Here's a trivia question. How many goals has the Leo girls soccer team allowed this season? Well, if they're number 10 in the state and you're asking me that question. They played 15 games, so I'm just throw that Five. Out Zero. Zero. They have not allowed a goal they have not all year. Fourteen zero and one, and the one tie was zero zero against Carroll. Wow. Against and the school, it's what twice as big as they are. Yeah, Carroll. Yeah, Carroll's pretty good size. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's a that's a pretty good season. Yeah. So, yeah. So if anybody other than Leo wins that sectional, we have a big story in our hands. Yeah. So. So. Yeah, but if Valley if Valley were to uh, win their girls sectional, they would play on the road. Yeah. The, uh, regional. All right. Well, we'll wrap it up. We'll take a break. We'll come back and uh, we'll wrap things up. Segment three. We'll talk some tennis. We'll talk some golf. We'll talk some cross country. Mm -hmm. Coming back here in a moment. We're talking sports with Val. The lawyers and staff of Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins LLP are here to provide the highest quality legal and professional service for their clients presently and for the future. From estate planning and trust to adoption and family law to appeals, probate, and more, Peterson, Wagoner, and Perkins has the knowledge and experience to serve you now and in the future. See a full list of services online at petersonwagoner.com. The Winning Edge is your local provider for all your sport and school athletic needs. From providing customizable sportswear to engraving trophies, The Winning Edge strives to help teams find their edge on the playing field. Call 574-223-223. 6090 or visit their website at www.thewinningedgeathletics.com. Timbercrest Senior Living Community in North Manchester offers services for all stages of life, including independent living, where you can maintain your independence, assisted living in an environment that will suit your individual needs nursing and memory care for those in need of full-time care. Licensed professionals provide rehabilitation services, including physical and occupational therapy. Call to schedule a visit at Timbercrest, a place to call home. All right, welcome back here. We're in our final segment. We're going to talk some girls golf, some tennis, and some cross country here to wrap things up tonight, talking sports with Val. Um, so golf, uh, everybody's out. They uh, yeah. we had a couple qualifiers that made it to the regional round, but unfortunately they came up a little short when it comes to uh, state round. Right. Uh, Ava Thomas of Rochester shot an 85 at the regional. Um, her personal best for 18 holes is 83. Yeah. So just off her personal best, she improved her sectional score by five strokes over at uh, Noble Hawk. Golf mm -hmm. links. Unfortunately, it took an 81 to get to state, so Ava just missed out by four strokes. And that's a pretty tough course up there, right? Uh, well, if you after playing at Stonehenge, uh, Noble Hawk is a, there are a few more birdie opportunities at Noble Hawk. Uh -huh. It's a pretty long course, but they're um, it's Stone, more of a link style, right? More, yeah, yeah, more of a link style. Um, yeah, a little more wide open, few, fewer trees. Uh, but it, if you can play at Stonehenge, you can play at Noble Noble Hawk. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you know. Uh, Madeline Weaver of Valley shot 87. So, again, missed, missed coming to state by six strokes. Ava's a freshman. Madeline's a junior. They'll both be back next year. Mm -hmm. I mean, they both had great years this year. Uh, but, again, and I, I guess part of the reason why I say that if you can play well at Stonehenge, you can play well at Noble Hawk. How about uh, Sybil Stilson of Northwood? She had a 62 at the regional. Set the regional record. She had, set the IHSAA state tournament record for lowest 18-hole score at any postseason round sectional regional or state 62 62 i shoot that in nine holes yeah that is incredible yeah wow and she shot 72 at the sectional uh-huh so she had 62 at noble hawk so again it goes to show you that yeah stonehenge is a tough course and northwood as a team as you might imagine because they had civil on their team they finished second and advanced as a team to state again homestead won it northwood was second penn was third so those are the three teams going to state. So, 
Yeah, so again, if you Stonehenge really prepares you well for the regional, and of course Rochester's had a great amount of success. Now, didn't Homestead have some ridiculously low numbers last year? Oh, yeah. They, the two sisters that they have are both shoot regularly in the 60s. Yeah. I mean, they, they're they crazy good. Yeah. I mean, they'll, they'll be right there with uh, whoever from Indy to at state. I mean, they, 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 could, they could win it. Yeah. Coach Parker is their girls' golf coach. He's also the girls' basketball coach at Homestead. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, they're great. He's a great coach in girls' basketball. I mean, he's right. won state championships in girls' basketball. Right, too. Yeah, right. So he's, they're tough. Yeah. Yeah, Homestead's tough. It doesn't hurt when you have, uh, you know, 2,500 kids or whatever to choose from. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're, they're going to they're gonna definitely be there. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, we should mention, hey, kudos to the Winnemac girls. Yeah. Uh, seven, 17th place. Unfortunately, season came to an end. 17th place out of 18 teams at the Lafayette Jeff Regional on Saturday mm. over at Battleground. But still kudos to Coach Radebush and his team. Uh, Bianca Quizar shot 96 Mm-hmm. And that was the low Winamax score. Took an eighty-four to make state as an individual. For yeah. It's worth. Yeah. But uh, Culver Academy won that uh, regional. Yeah. I've played that battleground course. That's a, that's an interesting course. It is. I, I I've always liked it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of fun to walk. At least it's yeah. pretty uh, long, but kind of narrow mm-hmm. for high school players. Yeah. Uh, Culver Academy Western took second, and mm-hmm. just a traditional power. Even so, though they're maybe not the biggest school. Western, and mm-hmm. then Crown Point was third. Yeah. So like Culver Academy and Western, obviously one's a private school, one's a public school, but still two smaller schools to get out of the regional. That's pretty good for them. Yeah. Well, that Culver Academy team, they've just been uh, doing really well across playing, the board Playing great year. golf. Yeah, I mean, they're going to be in the mix, too, on, at uh, down at Prairie View at Carmel for state. Yeah. But yeah, Huizar 96, uh, 97 for Kira Basinski, Janet Calfee had a great year, Olivia Link, uh, Giselle Lowry. Kudos to those girls. Great year. Won the yeah. conference... Won the conference by 70 mm. strokes two weeks ago. 70. 390s. 390. Seven, seven yeah, 397. Knox had 467. Yeah. Wow. Won it by 70. Yeah. It, it's not a huge golf conference for girls, but still, that's a, that's a huge number. Yeah, and second place to their sectional, which became tougher after they threw Logan Sport in there. Right, right. And, you know, I, I just, I, I always laugh because, you know, Culver Academy... You know, how many schools have a nine-hole golf course on their campus? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the academy does. So, mm-hmm. that you know, might give them a little bit of advantage, but you can't just go in there and, and learn golf as a freshman. I mean, they're they're coming in there. Right, exactly. I mean, exactly. you got to put the time in. I mean, look yeah. at Plymouth. I mean, Plymouth shot something like 420 at last year's sectional, this year 354, hmm. and Plymouth made it to regional. Yeah. And they, they, they had three players from last year's team on this year's team. Yeah. So, you know, Co- Coach, I know Coach Weymouth pretty well over at um, Plymouth. I mean, he does a great job, but, I mean, it just goes to show you, get on the course, play. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're not going to get better sitting around. Right. If you put in the time, you know, you get the results. Yeah. Uh, so the other sport, I guess, that's already into their playoff run is tennis. And as we film this, we don't know the results, but Rochester did win 5-0 against Knox. They're going to be taking on... Culver Academy tonight, right? Thursday right, it all night. happens really quick. The draws on Monday, the sectional start Wednesday, and most sectionals end on Thursday, though uh, some actually played out until Saturday. But yeah, Rochester, they drew Knox. Eighth straight year, they draw Knox. Yeah. It's only a four team sectional, so that's, yeah. things yeah. happen. That means it's also eight straight years. North Judson's drawn Culver Academy, and North Judson would be like, it's probably like, hey. <laughs> 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 Who's got the envelope? Why is it so cold? <laughs> yeah, what, what's what's wrong with you guys? Yeah, but yeah, Rochester beat Knox five uh, zero of those eight. The eight years they played in a row in the sectional, Rochester's gone six and two in those eight meetings, and played really well. Got up to a little bit of a. You tell us, I was I was I was at that ma- those matches and I was seeing them and in all those cases there's some sectional nerves there at the start, but in all those matches Rochester just really pulled away in the second set. They won them not only to win all five, but they won them all in straight sets. Um, you know, Cody Smith and Tanner Tanner Reinhardt kind of struggled a little bit. At, they were able to put away that first set, and really, you, know, you think of them as great, you know, great volleyers. But I really think they won it with their serves and their just their great ground strokes. And they kind of handcuffed uh, those Knox kids who were and pulled out that first set, and then won the second set more easily. Um, you know, two doubles. That was really the most interesting match. Um, Robert Bazo and uh, Jake Freeman won seven five six one. That first set was. It was five all, and it could. It looked like it could go either way, but Rochester was able to break serve, go up six five, and then pull out. 
hold serve to hold win that first set seven five, and then the second set they just seemed like they were just relaxing and just hitting the, just having a lot of fun. It was funny. Robert and Jake kept kind of a weird vibe between them. Robert's a little more loosey goosey, and Jake's pretty intense. Mm -hmm. Jake says, "I'm like a joystick. I yell at Robert and tell him where to go." Mm. And Robert says, "I usually just do the opposite." Just ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> they, have an, they have an interesting chemistry, and they, they've had a great year. They've only lost one match all year to mm -hmm. Peru. Yeah. And that's the Peru two doubles team is probably the best two doubles team in the area. So they played great tennis all year. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, but Culver Academy is obviously a step up. But, Bra you know, Braden Zink plays really well. He's Braden's got a lot of polish to his game. You know, he's a lot of, you know, a lot of top spin forehands and slice backhands. The Knox kid played pretty well for a set, but. He, he just couldn't hang with Braden, and Braden was just sharp, hitting his spots. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Brock Bowers at two double, two singles, one six one six one, yeah. just really sharp all night. And then Drew Strasser, you know, he won six two six love again, off to a little bit of a slow start, but you know, Drew Drew can play. Drew's, you know, he's athletic enough where he can really he can he can hunt down balls and retrieve balls. A lot of kids can, especially that three singles, and you can tell the Knox kid just got frustrated. Like, why does this kid keep hitting balls back to me? <laughs> And he just got frustrated and would make errors, and Drew would win points, and just it just kind of compounded on itself. Yeah. But Culver Academy, they they are they're a different animal. I right. mean, they have been ranked in the top twenty-five all year. They won the sectional seventeen consecutive years, and they won them all at home. Yeah. And it's a uh, you know for Rochester, their senior night ceremony was pretty short because they don't have any. They don't have any. Yeah. So they're going to all be back next year. Right. So. They got a lot to build on. I mean, they had a really good year, and, and you know, win or lose against the academy, they're uh, you know they're all going to be back. And you know, Coach Atkinson, I, I know, puts a lot of time and effort into the uh, program. Oh yeah, yeah, and it's you know it's a lot of attention to details, and it's a lot of you know the practices have to be harder than the matches, and they mm -hmm. are. And it's uh, well, regardless of how the Culver Academy match turns out, there's going to be a lot of excitement for next year because remember, all three singles players at Rochester are juniors, mm -hmm. so you'll have three senior singles players next year. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's a it's a great, you know, it's a it's a great uh, nucleus of a program. Yeah, yeah. With with Zink, Bowers, and Strasser. Right. Uh, and Cody Smith is a junior as well. Right. He'll be a senior coming mm -hmm. in next year as well. The number one uh, yeah. doubles player. Yeah. Yeah. And then his partner's a freshman this yep. year. Yep. So yeah. Uh, Coach Kindig and the uh, the Valley Boys didn't have quite as good of a, a first round effort there. I mean, right? They a tough drew, team. They drew Columbia City. Had to play Columbia City on their course. They lost five nothing. Valley finishes the season eight and thirteen. Kind of a rough finish to the season. They lose at home to Whitco on Friday. They lose at at Manchester on Monday in their last two TRC matches, and then they draw Columbia City on Monday night. Obviously, Valley knew that had to be an uphill climb because they had lost to Columbia City during the regular season. And it doesn't go their way. Uh, tough sectional, but again, there's no easy tennis sectional in the area. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there there's no classes, right? And there's no classes. I mean, again, Warsaw has won that sectional not, I think nine years in a row. Mm -hmm. So you've got the two uh, Thursday matchups: Warsaw versus Wawasee, Columbia City versus Whitco, and then the two winners meet Saturday morning at nine at Columbia City for the sectional final. So whoever wins that one is, you know, as we said with the Canterbury section, going to be battle tested. Right, right. Yeah. Regional and semi state will both be at Culver Academy. Yeah. Well, it's good to see them uh, back hosting events. Right. Yeah. Because they obviously they have the greatest, you know, the, the best facilities. Oh yeah, around. the facility is awesome because you can in, you get on that observation deck. I call it the pagoda, but you can watch all five matches at once if you right. want. Right. Right. And if you know what's going on, because I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> But you've been to a couple more than I have. Yeah, and they've got electronic scoreboards too at Culver Academy, so it's yeah. easier easier to follow along. I wouldn't say yeah. easy, but easier. Yeah. Uh, so uh, anything but else? Tennis Valley, we said uh, Valley's got no seniors, also. No seniors, okay. So yeah, both Rochester know. and Valley have no seniors. So yeah, and Valley had some good numbers too, right? Yeah, nine nine kids. Yeah, yeah. So they were able to fill out a roster. You know, Dylan Neese is a junior. Um, Cam Manuel, White Rider, the the one doubles team with uh, Anakin and Cooper, Anakin Pettit and Cooper Walls. That was they had the you know they they played really really well all year. And then mm -hmm. uh, Tristan Reagan and Brady uh, uh, Minix at two doubles. So everybody's back next yeah. year. Good. Well, it'll be interesting. You know TRC stuff. I mean, obviously Peru's the cream of the crop when it comes to TRC, but right. Can 
Can right. those two teams with, uh, you know, another year experience, can they maybe yeah. compete? Yeah, Coach Sane at Peru is a legendary coach. I mean, mm-hmm. he is kind of Coach Atkinson's mentor at Rochester. And all you hear about Peru is that they play tennis all summer. So, yeah, I mean, can you can you have that work ethic? Right. And I mean, I'm not saying that the Rochester and Valley kids don't, but... Well, I mean, if you think down the, the roster, you know, who who is tennis first? Right. I'm not saying that the Rochester kids, Valley kids don't. I'm just saying that the Peru kids do. Right. Most everybody thinks so. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's, to it's me, a, it's, it's a high hard. Standard. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to get a, a tennis first mindset. Right. Because there's there's so much other stuff, and you're still in Indiana to me. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know Brock Bowers is, you know, loves basketball. So, you know, is he going to spend a lot of extra time on the tennis court? You know, I don't right. know. Yeah. I asked Coach Atkinson. He he was talking about. Well, people say, "Geez, we man, that's a tough break for you. You get to play be in the same section at Culver Academy." He goes, "Well, where else would they send us to Warsaw? Right. To to Bremen to play right. Bremen and Plymouth that right. sectional. Right. To send us down to Peru. There's there's no, no, yeah. There's no easy ones. There's no easy ones. You right. got you got to earn it. Right. So uh, good luck as we, you know, as we film this, they still uh, have that match uh, tonight with Culver Academy. Obviously, by the time you see this, you'll you'll know the results. Um, Regionals uh, Tuesday and Wednesday at Culver Academy. Tuesday and Wednesday next week, Culver yeah. Academy. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, so let's let's move into uh, some cross country talk. Is uh, you know we're winding down Speaking the of uh, Culver Academy. Yeah, winding down the Culver season, the Culver season, the mm-hmm. cross country season. Yep. The Culver invite last Saturday, you know, obviously one of the biggest in the state. I think the second largest invite mm-hmm. in the state, uh, only surpassed by New Prairie, which was the Saturday before. Oh yeah, I can um, I can smell the I can smell the hamburgers on the on the grill from here. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we had some uh, some really good results uh, at the uh, CMA invite. Right, right. The Rochester Street, right. All of our area teams, there was a closed division and an open division. Mm-hmm. All of our area teams run in the closed division. The open division is for the top 27, so I don't know why it's 27, but the 27 largest schools that compete at Culver Academy, they compete in the open. Everybody else is in the closed. Mm-hmm. You can, If you are a closed school, you can, if you would like to, you can enter some kids or you can enter part of your team or your whole team in the open if you would like. All of our area teams in the closed stayed in the closed. They did not put anybody in the open. In previous years, we've had kids like Mitchell Rands and Wesley Meyer right. put them in the open, see how they compete with the cream of the crop. But right. for the this time, it was uh, just stay in the closed. And uh, I saw a couple names that uh, yeah. we hadn't seen in a while. The Rochester girls finished second. The Winnemette girls finished sixth out of, I think, 24 uh, teams. And Rochester got Madeline Calloway and Araceli Ochoa back for the first time this season. And that was great to see. And Madeline, I mean, she's just amazing. I mean, she runs 20-21 after not having run a race, basically a competitive race, since the 3,200 meters of the track state finals three months ago. Yeah, not only has she not run, she comes back and runs a good time. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, uh, now again, now Madeline's PR is 18.51. So 20-21 is, I would imagine for Madeline, that's maybe not... But it's still, taxi, for, but it, she it's hasn't still, ran all season. It's, it's amazing for mortal people. Yeah. 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 And then Zoe Seward came back after, uh, you know, Eric Lynn just said it was a rest week for Zoe. She didn't run at New Prairie. Well, she comes back and runs 2025, which is a season best. And then, you know, Lucy Rangel runs 20, 21 28, which I think is a PR. And then Araceli runs 21 55. Yeah. Araceli's run 2010 before. She didn't seem like she was. Uh, hurting too much, but boy, you get two girls who run under 22 minutes in your lineup, and boy, that changes everything. Has Ochoa ran at all this year? No, this, that was her first meet her of the year. Her first two, yeah. And, uh, you know, then, you know, Maddie Heinzman ran 23-16, or, excuse me, Kendall Bradley ran 22, 22, in the 22s, I think under 22-30, before she went out to her soccer game. Uh-huh. And then, you know, Maddie Heinzman runs 23-16. She's been getting a lot faster. She was in the 26s at the start of the year. She's not on a 23-16. Elena Boney ran a 23-33. So, yeah, I mean, this team is getting as fast and getting faster once soccer season ends for Kendall. Again, I know Chantal Rensberger doesn't want to right. think about soccer season ending anytime soon, but once it ends, Kendall should have fresher legs, and that's what Eric Lynn keeps saying. He goes, we haven't had fresh legs all year. Now we're finally starting to get them. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, this team is, again, it's... 
I hate to put it down that it comes down to one meet, but it's boy, you look at that semi state at New Prairie on October twenty third. It's that's the big one right mm-hmm. now. I mean, because really right now, I mean the TRC Rochester gonna be heavily heavily favored mm-hmm. and, uh, I'm, as long as they're healthy mm-hmm. and there are no quarantines and everybody's healthy at conference. They should roll to the conference title and sectional. You know, Warsaw's dominated that. I can't imagine Rochester would be Warsaw, but Rochester is firmly in second or third place. That'll move them on to regional. And again, I can't imagine anybody stopping them from being in the top five at the regional. Mm -hmm. Uh, So then you get to semi state. And can they finish in the top six at semi state and make state, which would be just the dream accomplishment? Mm -hmm. And uh, so conferences this weekend, correct? Yep. Basically, every conference in the state has their conference meet this weekend. Okay. Hoosier Plains, uh, if you're an Argus fan, it's Friday night. Okay. Hoosier North and TRC Saturday night. Yes. Saturday, Saturday morning. Yes. And uh, we're actually going to have some coverage of the uh, Hoosier North Conference match at Winnemac. Win- yeah. The Winnemac guys are going to have some coverage there. Right. I'm thinking the Winnemac girls and the Pioneer boys are the two favorite teams going into that. Winnemac mm-hmm. girls finished sixth. Great. I mean, they did a great job. I mean, again, look at the teams ahead of them. I mean, two of the... I think two of the five teams that finished ahead of them, well, one was Rochester, and two of them were from Ohio. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they, you know, Maggie Smith ran great. Caden Hoover's a freshman. She ran great. Kelsey Wegner, I mean, she's their number three. She beat a lot of teams at number one. Mm-hmm. Um, Alexa Sheets ran great. I mean, you know, Bethany Poor, she keeps she keeps coming on. We don't talk about her enough, but she's a great number five. Uh, and then you got you know six seven Kingsley Croft and Kate Collins. I mean they're just they're just a solid team at Winnemac. I can't. I think they're the heavy favorites, especially running on their home course right. at Town Park. Well, I'm I'm going to be uh, keeping an eye on uh, one Pioneer runner on uh, Saturday, Violet Montgomery. Uh, yeah. She is a sophomore and she ran a 2013 the other night at Peru. Mm-hmm. That's her PR. She is three seconds off of the school record held by. Kaiser. Mm-hmm. So she has, uh, you know, yeah, you talked about great. that course yeah. being pretty fast. Yeah, I saw her run. I saw a violent run at Clover Academy. She ran twenty forty one. So she chops twenty eight seconds off that time. And the Winnemac Town Park course it's con- it's considered one of the fastest courses in the area. It's a lot of pavement. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people set their PR on that course. I imagine that twenty ten is a very vulnerable record. Yeah. And can she break twenty? Yeah. You know, so there are a couple things there with that. Right. Kylie Ferris uh, ran twenty two twenty two the other day. I don't know what she ran at Peru, but she's you know she's another really solid number two runner. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, the uh, the Pioneer boys. I mean, they've uh, what I see. They they finished the season yeah. undefeated should, in we should, dual can meets. We, can we talk about the cast and girls too? While we're talking sure. about girls, Delaney Strasser. Sure Delaney Strasser ran twenty one thirty six the other day. That's a really good time for Delaney. She looked she looked fantastic the other day, and I think she's going to be in that all conference hunt. Uh-huh. And um, uh, Emma St- uh, Stinson ran uh, really, uh, really ran uh, well the other day. So you have her, Stevanna Young, um, Maddie Sproul. So it's the cast and girls are, are they're picking up their times as well. They've so, they've been uh, kind of struggling getting everybody there at the same time yeah, this year. Yeah, so that's good to see. The boys mm-hmm. have been uh, pretty solid there at casting as well. Right, uh, Austin Day ran great the other day. He was the top area finisher in seventeen twenty seven, so he's under seventeen thirty now. I mean, he is, he is legit. I mean, there was there was kind of a pack of about six or seven kids in that race that were just kind of way ahead of everybody, but then Austin was kind of in that secondary pack right there with uh, Dylan Steininger from Rochester and uh, Chris Rohr. So Austin's a premier runner. He he could win that individual title uh, on Saturday. Yeah, uh, he'll be right there with uh, you know Leighton Dot of Pioneer mm-hmm. and. Uh, Pioneer also hopes to get um, Carson Meyer back. Carson has been out with her due to quarantine. Mm-hmm. If they can get their kind of their big three back with Dot Meyer and Baker, that will really help their chances. But I, I mean, they did. They were the top. I mean, they did great even without Meyer the other day. I mean, they beat Winnemac and they beat Cast, and so I, I don't know who's going to beat them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at conference. Real and then quick. you've got uh, Jack Cooper's a, Jack Cooper and Austin Brook are two freshmen to really give them some depth. Sure, sure. Real quick, while I'm thinking about it, back to the academy, the junior high boys race, uh, the Culver Middle School team. Yeah, won, most of them. Won yeah. That, yeah, so the, that's uh, the Standfast boys. Yeah, we we talked about uh, that team a few times this year, and man, that's a that's a huge accomplishment winning that. Yeah. So congratulations to, to the Culver coach, Middle coach School. Coach uh, Tina Stacy and her team. Yeah. 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 So. 
Anyway, sorry to distract that. Okay, so yeah, the cast and yeah, the cast and boys. It's uh, you know Austin's been just tremendous in the year, and then you've got kind of some depth downward when you talk about uh, Caleb Stinson and uh, Brady Evans and uh, those guys. Um, TRC the TRC boys meet is coming up Saturday again. The TRC meet is at Valley on Saturday, and that is going to be very interesting. The girls, we think the Lady Zebras are pretty, well, well win that. Mm -hmm. uh, Manchester and Mac In fact, I think man the more interesting drama will be who will be second, Manchester and McConaughey. But yeah. if Rochester runs their A race, they're not going to be beaten. Um, the boys-wise, I think we've got a three-team, however it shakes out. This is going to be really interesting when you talk about Rochester, Wabash, and Manchester. I think mm -hmm. they're going to be, all three of those teams are right there. Um we looked at the state rankings. I mean, the, the times you can just throw a blanket over them. So it just comes down to who's going to run well on that day. Dylan Steininger, 1732 the other day, PR. And then Chris Rohr, 1752. Um, you know, looked a little tired at the end, but boy, I mean, he, he was running great for the first two miles. It's just, can he keep that going for that third mile? And then uh, the number three, Peyton Hyatt, 1812. Payton's ran 17.03 before. I don't know if he was maybe dealing with some tired legs, but we'll see how, again, Coach Lynn has said we've had, we haven't run with kind of fresh legs all year, so we'll see if all that work they put in now kind of, we'll see if it pays off right now. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, how about West Steininger, 18, 18, 18? I mean, we, I mean he, he'd only broken 19 minutes once in his life prior to this year, and he was running 18, 18. Wow. I mean, he was just a couple steps behind Peyton Hyatt the other day, mm -hmm. and then uh, Adrian Ochoa started the year I think around twenty thirty. Now he's now he's done a nineteen ten, mm. and he just can, he just continues to get uh, get faster and faster. Yeah, makes it nice too when the weather gets a little better. And it's a yeah, runner. it was a good yeah it was a good good running weather the other day. We were kind of worried because remember we had kind of a shower late Friday night, mm -hmm. uh, and but the course was pretty dry and pretty was it? yeah it was yeah. pretty good good. It was wet earlier in the week too, yeah. so that's that's good that that uh, got dried out pretty good. So conference meets uh, this weekend, mm -hmm. and then sectionals coming up the following weekend. Yep, next Saturday, October 9th. Okay, we've got uh, you know most of our area. You know, either if you're in our area, you either go to Manchester, or you go to Logansport, uh, Rochester Valley, Caston, and Culver, and Argus. I'll go to Manchester. Okay, Winnemac and Pioneer go to Logansport. So Caston goes to Manchester instead of. Goes down the road, basically in their own county. Hmm. Go figure. But all right. So uh, yeah, right. Any, top five teams, top ten individuals on non-advancing teams. Go right. move on. But yeah, that's we'll we'll talk about that again next week. Sure. All right. Well, good luck to uh, all the runners coming up this weekend in their conference meets, and uh, we'll we'll talk about the results uh, next week. Yeah, uh, Valley uh, Valley again. Evan Myers and Chesney Miller. Have been their front runners for their boys and girls, respectively. So we'll see how they do running on their home course. Yeah, yeah. Anything else uh, running wise? Oh, I think that's about it. Okay. Uh, I know Argus has had a couple. Argus has had a couple fast uh, girls. So I don't. I, I don't know if they'll have a full team at the Hoosier Plains meet. I don't. I don't even know where the Hoosier Plains meet is taking place. It's going to be five o'clock on Friday night, though. Okay. We'll be at Argus. They don't have a. They don't course. have a course, so I yeah. know that. Right. We'll narrow that down. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, good luck to everybody there. Coming up next on RTC TV4, we're going to have uh, Caston hosting the Culver Cavaliers, Pioneer hosting Knox, and then on Channel 4, it's going to be Rochester Zebras taking on Northfield. First time back, it's homecoming. Uh, the Zebras trying to get back into the flow of things after two weeks off, taking on a very good Northfield team. Don't forget, you still have time. The Ken Hughes Benefit Dinner taking place behind Barnhart Field there, right? I think if they set it up the same as they did for the FFA thing on the corner of the practice field there, should have drive through available, should have uh, walk-up available as well. Again, that's only uh, happening right as the uh, Rochester-Northfield game is getting ready to go. Uh, $8, you get a uh, pulled pork sandwich, chips, and a drink. And it all benefit Coach Ken Hughes. So come take advantage of that. Then go uh, check out the uh, game. If you want to go home and watch it on Channel 4, you can do that as well. So uh, we appreciate everybody tuning in, talking sports with Val here for week seven 
of the fall season and it isn't going to be long. Two weeks? Three weeks. Three weeks for uh, the first girls basketball practice. You know somebody on a team? I know a couple, <laughs> but yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I know somebody that's really looking forward to it. So mm -hmm. it's it's going to be interesting to see how this goes. I mean, I always, you know, I've got three daughters, if you don't know that, mm -hmm. at home. Uh, you know, so I've always looked forward. I, I, I honestly, truly would rather watch a girls' basketball game than a guy's. I just think they play fundamentally uh, better. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have the athleticism that some of the guys do that can get them out of trouble and, and then start doing dumb things. I think you got to play fundamentally uh, solid, and I, I just I, I would rather watch girls basketball. I really would. I, mm -hmm. And then you know even watching college basketball, I you know I would rather watch girls. I just been that way you know ever since I had my first daughter in 1996. Mm -hmm. So and uh, I don't know it may change now that I have a grandson, but <laughs> I, I'm very yeah. I mean I think we're gonna have a, a very competitive conference races in both. Yeah. Both of the conferences in our area. Yeah. Uh, I don't see North. You know, Northfield went nine and zero in the TRC last year. Obviously, they've graduated a few. They graduate. I think it's going to be pretty wide open. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very. I'm very. Don't sleep on Valley. Yeah, yeah. I think people say, "Boy, what are they going to be like without Sidney Wagner?" And boy, they're going to miss Sidney Wagner. Huh? Yeah. They're they're young, but they're pretty talented. I'm I'm curious to see how their young players kind of mesh in with the, the kind of that junior nucleus. Yeah. And you got a senior in Mercedes Snap. I, I, that's going to be a fun team to watch. Yeah, you know Rochester's going to be right there in the mix. I mean, and you know. uh, I, I'm the other team I'm really looking forward to watching is Argus. I, I mean, obviously, I'm not, there's not a team I'm not looking forward to watching, right. but that, that Argus team, uh, boy, they took Triton to overtime in the sectional final. I'm really interested to see how how they if they use that as a jumping off point. I, right. uh, this is a team that was playing. They improved so much last year, and uh, you look at you look at what Caston did last year, and and they're going to be just you know everybody's back for the most part. Everybody's back with a year of experience, mm -hmm. and now Pioneer isn't in their sectional. Yeah, yeah. Little little sneak peek here. I you see we start talking girls basketball, and we're already looking forward. Yeah, and the boys is going to be very interesting too. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be a lot of changes. Who's North? I think is going to be wide. It's been wide open the past few years. I see mm -hmm. no reason why it won't be wide open again. Yeah. And the TRC boys, Rochester nine and zero, but they graduated a ton. Mm -hmm. I, who knows? I mean, yeah. uh, there are some good. There are going to be some very interesting teams. There are a lot of well coached teams in that conference. I think Peru might be the favorite, but yeah, I, they've I got a lot coming back. Uh, Peru, I, you know, I think, but I think that Valley team is. They're going to be really motivated coming back, and I think. Hey, Southwood, as long as they have Cole Weiner, they got a chance. And Coach yeah. Burris on the sidelines. So yeah. it'll be a very interesting yeah. basketball season coming up. Yep. Yeah. We still got our ways to go. We're, we're, we're trying to, you know. And we've got a really interesting wrestling season coming up, too. Oh, my gosh, yes. Rochester yes. is loaded. Mm -hmm. um, they they are, had a really good season last year, and I think everybody is back. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we've got a state qualifier from Valley coming back. And we've oh, got, yeah. We've got a lot of good... A lot of good kids and teams in our area. Yeah, yeah. You can't tell we we like the winter season, can you? <laughs> so, well, we'll wrap it up because we could do another hour just talking about basketball, and we we got to hold our uh, hold our roll a little bit here, and and we'll talk about that in a few weeks. So, we're gonna we're gonna get uh, get to that when we get to it. So, uh, enjoy some football here yet tonight. Uh, Rochester Zebras versus Northfield next on Channel 4. Thanks for tuning in. Talking Sports with Val. What rhymes with great? Participate. Where does greatness start? Here, in the classroom. On the diamond. In the pool. On the field. Where will your greatness take you? To better grades. To more friends. Yeah! Be great. Participate!
Is your bank closing? Are you unhappy with your current bank or financial institution? At First Federal Savings Bank, we've been serving your community for 55 years. And whether you're in need of a home loan, commercial loan, checking account, financial services, or insurance services, we'll be here for you tomorrow. Make the switch today. And remember, we don't want to be the biggest bank, just the best.